It's lovely to see some of you again. I saw many of you last night. How about that Christmas party, huh? Yeah, really good time. Gets better and better every year. Gets uh, fuller and fuller every year, too. I, Phil and I were talking last night after the party that we were in the back behind the bar for two hours, uh, and we never stopped making drinks, not one time. And the food line was down the hallway. I mean, it was just like constant chaos and excitement around here. It was really, really fun. So thank you all for participating in that. Um, as Laura said, if you'd like to make a contribution to the Christmas campaign, which launched last night, you're welcome to do so. You can uh, find out more about that at one of the cards up by one of the exits, or you can go to the uh, tsgeng.org um, slash Christmas campaign and find out more about what we're giving to. Uh, but I'm happy to report that in less than 24 hours, we've already raised almost $6,000 uh, towards our $30,000 goal, which is awesome. So um, we've got a month left. Uh, you guys can do this. I believe it. So let's get together and, uh, and raise 30000 bucks for, um, for some really good causes that I, that I really do believe in. So check that out. Uh, tonight is the first Sunday of Advent. Um, and for different people, it might mean different things. Uh, people think of Advent as a word they've never, never heard of before. It might think of Advent as like um, maybe really just like code for Christmas. Um, some people don't think of it one way or another. But Advent is a season in the church calendar. It's actually the beginning of the church calendar year. And so you notice that our design theme has changed because we do that in kind of church calendar year. And so this is New Year's Day uh, for the church calendar right now. And in the season of Advent, we're preparing for something. Um, It's been oftentimes commercialized kind of as this extended Christmas season. We take the day, the 25th, and extend it all throughout the month. But but it means something different than that. It's not so much about the birth of Jesus or the barn or the Mary and the Joseph and the angels and the donkey and Herod and all of that. It's not so much about that. It's all about all the stuff leading up to that. All about the stuff that builds up to that experience. It's actually a short season uh, from December 25th for the next 12 days called Christmas Tide, and that's when we celebrate all of those things. And leading up to that, we actually have this time of anticipation, uh, this time of waiting and watching. Um, Advent is about patient penitence and pregnant anticipation. Uh, we oftentimes make Jesus the focal point character of the season of Advent, but in reality, at least in terms of the timeline, he's not even on the scene yet. Now, we always celebrate Jesus, and Jesus is always a part of our faith, and that's why we participate in the Eucharist every single week to reorient ourselves around the fact that he was crucified, he rose again, and he ascended. And and that's why we do that. But in the season of Advent, he's not even on the scene yet. We're actually talking about some other people typically during that time. If there's anybody that represents the season of Advent, if there's any one character that really embraces and embodies the season of Advent, it's Jesus' mother. If we think about it, I mean, think about the fact that she was the one who held him. She was the one who cared for him. She was the one who facilitated his development and gestation prior to his birth. That was her job. She waited. She waited and anticipated in the same way that we do throughout the series of Advent. Now, depending on your background, you probably reacted to that internally differently. If you come from a Catholic background, you thought, well, yeah, sure. Like, you know, the Virgin Mary, she's a very key component of this whole faith thing. And um, you might even think that uh, you might even pray to the Virgin Mary. You might think that she has some sort of cosmic power. People have a variety of different ideas about who Mary is. But if you're like me and you come from a Protestant background, you've never really thought much about Mary at all. We we don't think a whole lot about Mary because um, in some ways we've swung the pendulum the other way and said like, well, she's not a God, so we don't pray to her. So we just don't really think about her at all. But in addition to that, because of her gender and our Protestant patriarchal society, we have a tendency to dismiss her. In addition to her gender, also her age. She was probably somewhere around 12 or 13 years old, and it's easy to dismiss somebody who's that age, isn't it? Unfortunately, we don't listen to people of that age, assuming that they'll kind of go through this stage that they're in right now, and then eventually they'll like have something to add to society. But I think if you really think about it, there's some people even in our church who are of that age that have a lot to add. I think Kiri and Raya and Astral and I think Josiah, I think Keon, I think all of them have a lot to add and to contribute. And yet we, it's easy for us to dismiss somebody who's 12 or 13 years old. I think she's also dismissed because of her economic status. From what we understand, she probably didn't have a lot. And it was easy to dismiss her because she didn't have a lot of money. She didn't have a lot of fame. She wasn't all that important. And so Mary just kind of goes by the wayside. So based on our tradition and because of her gender and her age and her economic status, I think that we have overlooked and underplayed her story in all of this. When in reality, the season of Advent is very much embraced and embodied by her, maybe more than anyone else. And so for the coming weeks, we're going to spend our time building up to the incarnation, the moment at which Jesus becomes a part of the story and a character in this main theme. Um, 
And we're going to do that by focusing on four songs and prayers and declarations made by different people throughout, um, throughout the book of Luke, particularly in the first couple of chapters. And tonight, in order to set the stage to give us a bit of an idea about Mary um, and to understand some of the words that she has to say in response to what the angel Gabriel said to her, um, Kevin's going to come up here and read from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. Uh, you're welcome to follow along on the screens, or you can open it up in a Bible app if you'd like to. Um, so Kevin, take it away whenever you're ready. Luke 1, 26 through 38, uh, the birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and uh, will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come over you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word of God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I think that these words spoke by the angel Gabriel might be the most prophetically potent words of the New Testament. But because they're so embedded in this particular season, we only really look to them once a year. But if you were to look at them throughout the year, you might realize the weight and the magnitude of what the angel says. And then you might actually eventually get to the last words of that passage, the nine words that end that passage that are, are maybe the most significant response to a prophecy like that in the entire New Testament. These, are, this, these words, these nine words spoken by Mary are referred to oftentimes as the fihat mihi, which is a, a Latin term which embraces the, the, um, the essence of what she was saying when she responded to the angel and said, let it be unto me as you have said. Let it be unto me as you have said, fiat mihi. In this, embedded in this prayer or in this response by Mary are two things. First, a prayer, which, are, which is made up of words that she speaks to him. And second, a posture, a posture that she maintains in that moment and that she maintains as she continues on um, throughout this process. And I think we can learn from both. And so we're going to start with the prayer and we're going to look at the words that she says and the words that were said to her. In this prayer or in this thing that she says in response, she says three things. First, let it be. The second, unto me. And third, what you have said. Let it be unto me what you have said. Let's start with the last one. I think in order to understand this, we have to take a look for a minute about exactly what was said to her. Let's look at the components of that. The angel said this, Mary, you will become pregnant despite your virginity. Elizabeth, you will become pregnant despite your old age. The baby in Mary's womb will be God incarnate. Think about that for a minute. That's extremely powerful. Fourth, nothing is impossible with God. Those are four things that in just a few words, the angel says to Mary and her response is absolutely incredible. First, she says, let it be, which is basically affirming it and saying, yeah, I agree. I'm down. That makes sense to me. You should do that. This required a tremendous amount of faith. And I think it may be required an amount of faith that only someone her age would have been able to hold. I've always thought of her age of being 12 or 13 as just sort of a fun fact. You know, like we throw that out there and someone goes, oh, that's really interesting. And then we move right past it. But in reality, if you think for a moment about the faith that you were able to hold, the imagination that you had when you were 12 or 13 years old, it was significantly different then than it is now, right? If an angel appeared to me when I was 12 or 13 years old and said something like that, I might say, yeah, that makes sense. Like, that sounds great. You should, that sounds, you should do that, you know? But just a few years later, I'd be like, well, maybe, you know, 16, 17 years old, I'm going, maybe, but I have less of an imagination for that stuff than I did a few years ago. 
And here I am, here I am a full 20 years later, and I would have um, a biological argument for why uh, I can't get pregnant. <laughs> I'd have a biological argument for why a virgin couldn't be pregnant. I have a biological argument for why Elizabeth in her old age could not be pregnant. I have a theological and philosophical argument for why God incarnate could not be incarnate or grow in a womb and be born. I'd I'd have arguments against that. I'd caveat the heck out of that. So I wouldn't say let it be. I'd be like, I mean, this is going to take a while, Gabriel. Like, how much time do you have? Because I have some issues with the thing that you just said. But this 12 or 13-year-old girl responds with let it be which took a tremendous amount of faith. The second thing that she says is unto me, which goes deeper into her thought and her reaction. It's not just, yeah, let it be so. It's let it be unto me. I would like to experience this. And that required a tremendous amount of courage. The first required faith. The second required courage. Pope Benedict XVI said, Mary's example of faithful perseverance in doing the will of God and her heavenly reward are a source of courage and hope for us all. She's an inspiration to us in that regard. And now I have no idea if Mary had a choice in the matter. Like, I don't know if she could have like politely declined and been like, thank you, but no, thank you. I think this is a great idea, but you should do this to someone else. It could, she would like, let it be unto that person. I don't know if she was allowed to do that or had that latitude, but either way, she was willing to say, yeah, let it be unto me. And in that, in that moment and in those two words, unto me, we see the posture of Mary. And her posture is one of receptivity, one of openness, one of willingness. She makes room. She opens up to receive the Christ, to, to facilitate the Christ, to be hospitable to the Christ. It is a great irony that nine months later, she is told that there was no room in the motel and thus delivers Jesus in a barn. It is a great irony that Jesus' own people rejected him and did not receive him. Throughout history, right now in 2018, for the remainder of humanity and even in this room, some people will maintain a posture of rejection towards God rather than a posture of receptivity. But Mary gives us a different example. She sets a different trajectory for us in this season of Advent, a a trajectory and an example of openness, uh, of willingness to receive God to receive what he might have for us, as scary and tremendous and wild and earth-shattering as it might be. St. Augustine said, The world, being unworthy to receive the Son of God directly from the hands of the Father, he gave his Son to Mary for the world to receive him from her. You might take issue with the first half of that quote, but the second half, I think, gets to the heart of what Mary was tasked with. In her receptivity, she she then sets an example for us to be also be receptive. This 12 or 13 year old girl in the first century with next to nothing receives God and in doing so becomes our fearless leader throughout the anticipatory weeks of Advent. Our receptivity like Mary's prayer and posture take great faith and courage. Uh, these are not easy things for us to muster and they often take time for us to grow these things. They aren't things we can just flip a switch and start doing which is partly why I'm excited that we have an entire season to work on these things. Uh, We are often unreceptive towards God and keep him at arm's length because we are afraid of what might happen if we open up. Now, I was very specific in choosing the word afraid because I think we oftentimes peg it with doubt, but in reality, it's not doubt that keeps us from being close to God and being receptive towards God. It's fear. We're afraid of two things, if I had to guess. The first is what might be said, and the second is what might be unsaid. In the season of Lent, if you might remember from this year, we relied on a quote from Henry Nouwen that said this, if we create space in which God can act and speak, something surprising will happen. And we spent 40 days opening ourselves up to some of the things that God might do. And at the end of the season, some of you wrote on three by five cards or wrote in an email to me some of the things that God did unexpectedly during that time. But my guess is if you participated in that part of Lent and God did nothing, you probably didn't tell me about it. Because the truth is that for a lot of us, when we say, God, we're ready to receive and we're ready to hear what you have to say, nothing happens. And that's maybe the scariest possibility when we think about opening ourselves up to receive what God has for us. So the first is we're afraid that of what might be said. We're afraid because we've all heard those stories of like yeah, that person asked God for what he wanted and then they ended up doing something totally wild and crazy and that's not really the life that I want, so I'm just not going to ask. 
And then we're also afraid of what, that he might say absolutely nothing at all. I remember a time, uh, it was a few years ago, I went down to Sacred Heart, which is a, a Jesuit retreat center down in Sedalia. And it was going to be a silent retreat. So it was a day of silence, and I was going to listen to what God had to say to me, and I was really excited for it. And I'd cleared the day, and I went down there, and I sat on a bench, and I was looking at the mountains, and there was like a deer and a chipmunk and flowers, and it was amazing. And I was like, I'm ready. And I think I said something to that effect, like, God, I'm ready for the thing that you have to say to me. And maybe clearer than anything I've ever heard from God, the response was, I don't have to do that. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you do. Absolutely. Yeah, I've cleared my day. You know what I mean? Like, this, was, this is my plan. And um, this is the time. Like, I, these are the things that I, you know, I need to hear some things from you. And I, I've carved out some time for that. And, uh, and over and over, and I got this stronger and stronger sense that he was saying, I, do, I actually don't have to say anything because you happen to have carved out a day for me. Um, in fact, you've been doing a lot of talking, and, and you haven't really taken the time to listen um, so this might just be really quiet. And I spent the whole day in total silence, not just like silence and I was hearing from God, but like complete silence. And I realized at that time that like in what relationship that you have ever been in, could you talk for like years and then all of a sudden be like, hey, did you have anything to add to that? Because I, you know, I'm ready to listen now. It just doesn't work that way. But we're afraid that if we open ourselves up, he might say something like, I've got nothing or I don't want to say anything at all. We're afraid of that. But Mary is our inspiration to be receptive without being fearful. She has the courage to receive, the courage to open herself up, and it's an example set before us. St. Teresa of Lisieux says, In trial or difficulty, I have recourse to Mother Mary, whose glance along alone is enough to dissipate every fear. In a quote, we get this idea that if like Mary was to you know, look at you, to set her gaze on you in her face alone, somehow there would be so much courage that it would dissipate the fears that I have in my own life. It's an amazing example when we think about this 13-year-old girl in the first century and the receptivity and the great courage that she displayed. I actually think for a moment of um, some of the things that you were able to believe when you were young around this time of year. Santa Claus, maybe, Elf on the Shelf, I have no idea. If you come from a Jewish background, the, the, the understanding of the menorah, right, that like you had like a candle that it could only burn for one day and it burned for a lot of days, like, you know, that's an amazing miracle. That's sort of a fantastical event. And, and it's easier to believe those things when you're young. You, you probably enjoyed the story of Jesus being born and the angels and the singing and the manger and all of that more when you were a kid because you were able to hold that kind of an imagination, Perhaps Mary's age isn't just a fun fact, but necessary uh, for leading us in this prayer and posture of receptivity. At the end of Gabriel's words, he adds this little section. He says, um, nothing's impossible with God. And it isn't interesting that decades later, Mary's son uh, would take those words and change them just a little bit and say, with God, all things are possible. I think you'd be surprised if during this season, like the season of Lent, you opened yourself up to what God might do. And maybe your prayer would be like Mary's prayer, the fiat mihi, let it be unto me as you have said. What might you choose to believe tonight? What might you choose to believe in this season? What sort of things could you possibly be open to if you were willing to open up your hands a little bit, to open up your heart just a little bit? I think the fiat mihi is intimidatingly brief, and I don't like how clear it is because I would like to add a lot of things to it, right? A lot of caveats like, let it be unto me as you've said, as long as this and that and maybe that. A lot of conditional statements. That's what I'd prefer to add to it, frankly, if I were to pray this myself. And you might feel the same way. But if we're to just to tear a page out of Mary's book here and approach Christ the same way that she does and open ourselves up, I think we might be surprised what would happen. It's interesting that this prayer is so short, only nine words, that we could say, let it be unto me as you have said. And we could say that in one breath. Hey, raise your hand if you've ever heard of a breath prayer before. A few people heard of a breath prayer, okay? Breath prayer is sort of a practice um, where you pray something that's so short, you could say it in one breath. And it's something that you could say repeatedly or regularly throughout the day. You could say it before you go into your boss's office for that meeting, let it be unto me as you have said. Before you get in the car and hit traffic, let it be unto me as you have said. 
Maybe you turn your radio off and every time you hit a stoplight, let it be unto me as you have said. Maybe before you enter this building or before you leave this building or as you're with your roommates having a difficult conversation or you're with your spouse or your kids, let it be unto me as you have said. What if that was our breath prayer? Maybe leading into the season and throughout the season, let it be unto me as you have said. That is my hope for you. It's a season of pregnant anticipation as we approach the most amazing story perhaps ever told about God incarnate coming to live among us, to be among us, to be with us, to love us, to lead us, to guide us. And as we continue to pray that prayer, my hope is that you would continue to be receptive and to maintain that posture throughout the season. Let's pray together. Father, let it be unto us as you have said. Amen.